Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good to have you here this afternoon. Looks like we'll have another summer rainy day out there in places, but uh, hopefully it'll come this way. Okay? We could sure use it. But uh, okay, um, we're continuing our study of Romans. And last week we started Romans 6. And we're talking about a very unpopular topic within much of the evangelical realm these days. Many don't even want to talk about the issue of sin. But yet Paul talks about it pretty heavily for two chapters. I mean, we'll be talking about it here in 6, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Um, not that that's the only place he'll mention sin, but I mean, these are the real focal points on the matter of sin. Because guess what? They had some of the same problems back then that we have today. Uh, there were many trying to find loopholes. You know, you know how humanity is, right? Whether it's the IRS taxes, whether it's election, or whether it's politics, always somebody's trying to find a loophole to see how they can get out of something. And so it was no different back then. One of the problems that they were having back then was that people would come to salvation and as they got an appreciation of what grace was through Jesus Christ, they figured, hey, <laughs> I, can, I can be the same person I was before I came to saving grace. And all I have to do is just ask forgiveness and I can still go out and do whatever I want to do and then just come in and ask forgiveness again. And so I'll receive grace and I'll be forgiven. I'll be fine. I don't have to worry about anything. And so, of course, Paul addresses that right up front. And he says, basically, he says to, to those people that are trying to take advantage of their proclivity to sin and to want to have their fire insurance, he said that God forbid. In other words, they shouldn't be living in that type of lifestyle. Because one of the things that the Holy Spirit does when he comes into those through saving grace is that he works in us to help transform us to become who he wants us to be. And so God wants us to walk in his righteousness, not in the world's way. And I mean, that's what we come out of, isn't it? We come out of the world and the world is where the problem lies. Uh, because I mean, the, the world is a magnet to our flesh and our flesh has a proclivity to want to do what the world wants. And so that's where our struggle lies as we walk with the Lord, is that we tend to, you know, even though we know we are being transformed to become more like Christ, the world still has a certain amount of pull on us because we still have that fallen nature that unfortunately doesn't go away as soon as we ask the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart and basically accept his grace gift of salvation and turn our lives over to him, it would be nice, as I've said before, if we could just get rid of this flesh that is so problematic so that we could fo just focus on developing in righteousness to become more like Christ. But the reality is it doesn't work that way. Um, it would be nice if it did, but it doesn't. And that's why all of us, every day, we deal with some level of sin in our lives. Now, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, now it's even though we deal with sin in our lives, it's not once we come in this, the saving grace that Christ has given us, that is not who we are anymore. Yes, there will be sin, but we are a new creation. We are developing, we're being transformed out of that old nature into the new nature. Um, now, and that works on various levels, okay? It's not like you can just say, okay, today uh, I'm not going to lie from now on, okay? Or I'm not going to be jealous of anybody from now on. Or I'm not going to be angry with somebody from now on. Or I'm not going to drive on I-4 from now on because that makes me sin, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> But that's, that's what we deal with. You know, I mean, we know 
that there still is something in us that still is part of our hearts because the Bible makes it clear that everything that we do comes from the heart. So if we still have a certain level of proclivity to sin, it's still something where we haven't totally turned over our heart 100% to God. Because if God was the only one that ruled in our hearts, then everything we did would be synonymous with God's character and in the way that he would represent himself, just like Jesus did. Of course, that's what we do is we're working on becoming more like Christ every day, because that is the Father's will for us. And we'll talk more about that in chapter eight. But what we see is that this is an ongoing day-to-day -day issue that we deal with. And sin is real. And Paul's not sugarcoating it here in all these areas that he's talking about. In the first you know, dozen verses of chapter six, he's talking about exactly where sin comes from and those issues that are sin, okay? That we just have that way of being. That, and if, if you remember, I've mentioned Galatians 5.16 is a good verse because it says we that uh, the, if we walk by the spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh, right? I mean, we have, and Romans 8 speaks about it too, right in the first few verses. I mean, when the Holy Spirit indwells us, he is the one who guides and directs our every step. And he intercedes for us because he knows those things that we struggle with. And he brings those before the throne as, you know, since he's God, he brings those things before the throne knowing that we need help if we're still struggling with something we need help so sin is real sin is a struggle sin is against god and sin comes from the heart so i mean when you think about all that you realize holy smokes that means my heart really needs some serious work because i'm still sinning that means my heart still isn't totally 100 percent turned over to god but see, that's where grace works in. Grace doesn't fit within how we judge. We judge people on a basis of saying that there has to be a payment for something that somebody has done if it's wrong, okay? Especially if it was wrong against us personally, that there has to be some kind of payment. Well, most of the time, some people take that even to the extreme and they say, I'm going to get I'm going to get vengeance on that person or I'm going to get even with that person. Right. Because that's our natural proclivity is to say, hey, th everything's got to work out at least even. Hey, since I'm a Christian, I'm saying it, it, there has to be something that works out so that at least from an even nature, that guy gets their just due. Now, in our old nature, we say, hey, I want to come out ahead. But we say, no. Nah, we are we are so sanctimonious and self-righteous that we say, no, nah, we just want to come out even. But what did Jesus say? No, nah, we're, we're to love our enemies, right? We're not to take vengeance on them. He says vengeance is his. He'll take care of the vengeance side, right? We're to love them. But yet we still have trouble getting to that, especially when somebody does us wrong. Well, think about that. If that's how we think, God doesn't think that way where grace is involved. Where grace is involved, when we sin, he forgives us. Wow. Hey, did you hear that? When we sin, he forgives us. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to get, yeah, amen to that, Gene. You know, he doesn't say, I'm going to get even with Ted because, man, that was really nasty of him, you know, to come against me with that sin. Because what is sin? Sin is dysfunction of my heart before God. In other words, I'm doing something that is contrary to God's way, right? That's sin. And so when we look at these kind of things, we realize somebody has to set a standard for what is right and correct. And the first four words of the Bible give us that focus on who's the one that sets the standard, right? In the beginning god right so we know it's god who establishes the standard he's the creator and he's the one who establishes the standard of what is right 
and what is wrong, of what is good and what is evil. I mean, that makes sense. So when we ate, and I say we, because hey, I guess, you know, great, great, great grandpa Adam and great, great, great grandma Eve, you know, I mean, when they sinned, we're family, right? So we inherited that sin. And that sin was what brought about the whole thing of good and evil, or at least the understanding of good and evil and the proclivity then to do whichever one we want. And for all intents and purposes, we find that, you know, Jeremiah talks about that the heart is naturally wicked. You know, in other words, it's like our heart has a default of evil within it. Not good, but evil. Even though we know relatively well what is good, it's that evil that seems to be pervasive in our hearts. So that is what we're overcoming when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise God, Jesus, when he died on the cross, died for all our sins. That's already a done deal, okay? It's not like he has to say, okay, I'm going to forgive you today, and, well, I'll think about forgiving you tomorrow. No, he's already forgiven those who come into a personal relationship with him. Now, you say, well, if I am forgiven, then why doesn't Romans 6, 1 and 2 still apply to where I can go out and sin all I want? And then just kind of come and say, hey, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Hey, that was a fun time I had. And I praise you. You know, hey, I, I know it wasn't what you wanted all the way, but at least you forgive me. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Martin. Thank God. Our, you know, like the Bible said in, in Hebrew that Christ is our high priest. You know, he understands our weakness, you know, our sin, because basically he went through it. He went, he went in. Uh, uh, he was tempting all aspect in, in in his life with without sin, so that, that's a great thing. Uh, and and, and the, basically, the uh, the history, or you say the uh, the process of, of, of Christian is okay. Salvation plus uh, sanctification is equal to glorification. Amen. So our final process will be until our, we will be glorified. Amen. That's it. It will be over. But until then, we are going to deal with sin. Amen. Absolutely. And that's why these two chapters, six and seven, Paul deals with it so much because a lot of times there are, there are denominations within the evangelical realm that espouse that forgiveness is something that only happens when you confess your sin. In other words, they lean very heavy on 1 John 1, 9, that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so because they espouse that type of requirement in terms of forgiveness, they also usually lean on to the fact that you can lose your salvation. But when you, when you talk to these people that are in these denominations and you ask them, well, wait a minute. If you can lose your salvation for a sin, what is every sin going to make you lose your salvation, even if it's a little white lie? Or maybe you did a white lie because you didn't want to hurt somebody's feelings, you know, that you were trying to take care of. Do you lose your salvation in that case? Or do you have to do something really egregious? You know, I mean, like kill somebody and then you lose your salvation. But, you know, that's one of the things that they can can't come up with an answer about but when you point them back to those scriptures especially in the area here like in romans where we're you know it is clear that our salvation is eternal you know once we come into christ saving grace it is forever and grace is god's love and forgiveness through jesus christ and his sacrifice for all those who come into a relationship with jesus christ and are adopted by the father as it says in Romans 8. Um, when you bring them into that, they just see they're thinking too much on the human level. They aren't thinking in the heavenly way, the way God, you know, is determined to function in terms of his love and his mercy and his grace. They just can't quite grasp that. And yeah, if you think on a human level, 
I can understand why they would think the way they do. You know, that, hey, you know, God, God has to get his just due on every sin. Well, if that's the case, then why did Jesus die? Why did he shed his blood? Why did he die for all the sin, for all people, or all time? You know, and yeah, many will reject it and not be forgiven. But for those that do, all their sin is wiped clean because Jesus paid the price for it. They can't seem to grasp that that is something that God would do. They just can't see that much love, mercy, and grace wrapped up in a package that is available to those who come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So they hold sin as basically the one thing that God can't handle. Well, he already handled it. Jesus already handled it on the cross. But yet there are people in those denominations that seem to think that, nah, that's just, that's beyond God's ability. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. The, the question is, if you put them to a test, and you will. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. Hey, unmute yourself there, brother. I screwed up. I messed up. I was trying to lower your so, hand. It's okay. it's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, technology. Uh, so you, you, okay. So you will question them and say, okay. So. <laughs> If our salvation depend, depends on, the, on, on, on human behavior, how would you deal with the, with the, with the verse that says that God chose them, the elect, before the foundation of the world? Yeah. So now we'll say, okay, we know God is immutable. He doesn't change. So you yeah. tell me that God chose someone, chose Peter, right? Before the right. foundation of this earth, now he committed a sin, and he lost his salvation. Right? So what happened? So 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 like. so that means God God God's changing, right? Yeah. He changed his mind. The same. Yesterday. Okay, today, but the Bible, Bible said that God does not change. He's immutable. Amen. So how would you? You know what I mean? It's, it's a it's a lot of a lot of uh, ideology out there that contradicts the Bible. That's right. As you as, as you know, the the Bible have, we have to see the Bible as a whole picture. Amen. Once you take one verse out of context, then we have a problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll tell you, God's grace is sufficient. And yeah, M Martin's right. God doesn't change. The Bible is clear that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And actually, King David had a good appreciation of grace. I mean, you see it really, really well in Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. I mean, those two Psalms show that even then, he understood God's mercy and grace. And I mean, it explains it in those Psalms. You would think that those Psalms would be New Testament Psalms, not something, you know, written a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross. I mean, they're beautiful. If you get a chance, read those two Psalms. I think you'll be blessed in them. So, so now we're going to pick up at verse, I think I said 12, and uh, uh, 15, verse 15, I think. Um, and we're going to, I think it's 15. Yeah, well, I wrote 15. Hopefully that's right. Uh, we're going to pick up at 15, and we're going to see what Paul talks about in terms of the issue of sin and the issue of righteousness and where we who are in Christ should be standing and understand our position in Jesus Christ, okay? And so he's going to bring that out. We're going to talk about that a bit, but in chapter seven, he's going to jump back into the whole issue of this weakness of who we are and the problematic issue. And I mean, he'll make a statement that, you know, I think we all can really understand you know, that which I want to do, I find myself not doing. And that which I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. What a wretched man that I am. Who's going to free me from this existence, you know? But then he goes off into Romans 8, 1, that, but in Jesus Christ, there's now no condemnation for those that are in him, you know? So, I mean, it's a beautiful picture of showing who we are and the struggle we have, but Jesus did it all. But we'll, let's talk today about picking up in verse 15 about what it is to understand the, the contrast between sin and righteousness and where we who are in Christ Jesus sit in that respect. OK, any questions on the intro before we pray? Hey, Corey, how you doing, brother? 
Hi, Ted. Hi, everybody. Hello. Is Misty Hi. with you? Yeah, They're back I'm here. There. Hey, Hello. Misty. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Howdy. Hello. Hi. Okay. Let me go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for the amazing love you, you showered on us through Jesus Christ. And man, we, I, I, I mean, it is so amazing that, I mean, many people just can't grasp the wonder of what you have done for all mankind. But you carried it out. And we thank you for that amazing love and the grace that you have showered on us and the redemption. Uh, for those who come into saving grace with Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to understand what you have carried out for us. And now that we are in you, that we will be more transformed. And as Martin said, sanctified day to day to become more like Christ and to put the old nature behind, to die to self every day and walk in your righteousness through the power of your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds as we study today. And I thank you and give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me go ahead and share out here. And let's, we're picking up in Romans 6 at verse 15. Okay. So now that he's been talking about sin and the problem of sin and the people's proclivity towards sin. And even though being in Jesus Christ, look what he says in verse 15. He says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Ah, so he's basically phrasing a little different than what he phrased verse one above. And he's saying, since this is the way it is, since grace is there for those who are in Christ Jesus, and we aren't under the law anymore, because, hey, remember, Jesus took the law unto himself. That's in Colossians 3. He fulfilled the law for us, okay? So we're not under that law in the sense of the Old Testament Jews, the way that they had to live under the law, because now we're under grace. And now that we understand that, since we're not under the law, but under grace, should we continue in sin? Or are we to sin because of that? And look what he says. He says, by no means. In other words, you know, in today's vernacular, as I've said before, no way, man. You know, it's it's that kind of statement that he's trying to make here. We're not to be in sin just because we don't have a law to judge us in that sense because we're under grace. But that doesn't give us license to go out and sin just because we want to or because it's like, well, I just can't. I just can't seem to get this flesh under control. So, oh, well, you know, whatever. No, that's not what we're called to. Also in Galatians 5, if you look at the fruit of the spirit uh, toward, you know, around verses 20, 21, he's talking about, look at that last fruit of the spirit. Of the nine fruit of the spirit that are listed, self-control is, I think, one of the most important. I mean, love is at the top, self-control is at the end, but self-control is important because, I mean, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians where he beats the body to keep it under control. In other words, that's self-control. Now, I mean, that's a figurative way of saying that he doesn't want the body to end up dictating how he's going to live. He wants the spirit to drive him to how he's going to live. So he's saying, I beat the body. In other words, I put this body to death every day because otherwise I'm going to have a proclivity to walk in sin. But instead, I don't want that. That's the area of self-control where the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to control the flesh, put the flesh to death to walk in his way. Okay, that's that's one of the nine fruit of the spirit, self-control. So that's what he's talking about in verse 15. It's just because we have a proclivity to sin doesn't mean we're supposed to go and sin and just say, oh, well, you know. So in verse 16, he says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, 
or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, here's where he brings out the whole argument on the contrast between sin and righteousness. Those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ and he has come into our lives, he sits on the throne of our hearts. He is our master and our Lord and our God. We focus on him to walk in his way. What happens to us is that our old nature, where we were a slave to sin, has changed. Now, our new master is Jesus Christ, and we follow him in righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have changed. Now, as I said earlier, unfortunately, the old nature doesn't go away. It tags along. And the Bible makes it clear that we will struggle, that the spirit fights against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. That's an ongoing struggle that will continue until the day we die. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, we still will get upset on I-4 before we get ourselves, you know, under control when somebody cuts us off, right? Because, I mean, it's just, it's that old nature that, man, just in a nanosecond, it flares up and you realize, oops, I, I really don't have this flesh under, totally under control. There are things that still, you know, just tweak me and get me to a point where it's like, before you know it, I've sinned, and I'm like, oh, Lord, forgive me for my sin, and forgive me for my weakness, because, but that's the Holy Spirit who prompts us and says, is that really who you are, Ted? Should you be cursing that person out in that other car? Is that really what Christ would do? You know, it's that kind of thing, and all of a sudden, you realize, yeah, that's not who I am. In Christ Jesus, I am now a slave to righteousness, which leads to life eternal, not to sin, which leads to death. So that's why he brings this out. And he brings it out as slaves, because remember, a slave is representative of its master, right? So if a slave is going to do work, he's doing it for his master, and he's doing whatever his master wants him to do. Well, that's the same with sin or righteousness. The question is, who is our master? Is our master sin or the evil one? Or is our master righteousness and God? You know, because he, we are to become more like Christ. So what it comes down to is that in our new nature, we are being transformed daily to become more like Christ. We'll talk about that more in Romans 12 when we get especially to the first several verses in there where he uh, where Paul provides like some practical application of our walk with the Lord and what that means in terms of who we are becoming. So he says in verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who are once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart, notice, from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin, have become slaves to righteousness. Now, notice that this is a matter that doesn't just happen in our own strength. Can any of us, in and of ourselves, become good? Can we become righteous in and of ourselves? No way. I mean, we even see like back in Abraham and for Noah and Abraham, both of them were considered righteous but how were they considered righteous if Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet? It says that they were considered, their faith was counted to them as righteousness. In other words, they had belief that God would be able to do what he promised and said. And remember, this is before there was any Bible or Torah or scriptures of any sort. They came into a relationship with God as a matter of surrender and by faith in trusting God that was counted to them as righteousness. Today, we come into that same righteousness through faith, for, through grace, by faith in Jesus Christ, just like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talk about, right? So when we come, whether it was Old Testament, you know, uh, believers, or whether it is us today through the cross and Jesus Christ, the issue is, is when it was all about relationships. It was all about coming into believing 
in the one who did everything for us, whether it was the God of the Old Testament, which is still the God of the God today, which is Jesus today, just as much as his Holy Spirit of the Father. But we see that it still is about relationship too. It is about coming into a walk with the Lord and he is our strength. He is our ability through the Holy Spirit to overcome our weaknesses of the flesh, our weaknesses of our sinful nature, our proclivity to sin. He is our strength to overcome. And he is the one who has set us free from sin. And now because of that, we have become slaves to righteousness, which is something that is building for us all the way till we get to go be with him in heaven through glorification. That is yet to come, okay? But it is the culmination, the hope of our salvation and our sanctification through Jesus Christ is our glorification. So any questions so far on what Paul is building toward here showing that we are a different people now, no longer who we were before and our slave, you know, our slave nature to sin. Yes, we still have a proclivity to sin, but we are no longer a slave to sin. And now we are a slave to righteousness with a growing desire and a development through the Holy Spirit to become more like Christ. We call that sanctification. Any questions on, on any of that that Paul's talking about or comments? Okay, so then let's move on to verse 19, okay? He says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. In other words, he's saying the best way I'm explaining it to you in a way that you can understand it more from a human perspective. Because I mean, when we speak of something from a spiritual perspective, sometimes some of the uh, younger Christians, so to speak, don't fully grasp what that means yet in their walk with the Lord. I mean, it takes a while to get to understand the wonder of God's love and grace and mercy, and because it is contrary to the order of things within the natural world. And so that's why he's saying, hey, I'm explaining it to you the best way I can so that you can understand it from a just a regular everyday description and understanding perspective. So he says, I'm speaking it to you in human terms, not from a, you know, heavenly terms, because they wouldn't fully grasp that yet, because we in our natural limitations don't have the mind of God 100%, okay? I mean, we have to lean into the Holy Spirit to let him develop us, to become more like him, to be united as one and, and just give ourselves over to him. And little by little, we become more and more like Christ. And as we develop, then we understand these heavenly things more and more, not from an intellectual perspective, but from an intellectual plus spiritual kind of amalgamation. It's what God does in and through us so that we can understand who he is and that we are in him and he in us. And we rely on him to be carry out what his plan and purpose is in each and every one of our lives. And we'll talk more about that as we understand the gifts of the spirit in chapter 12, because he, he's developing us to be more like Christ in the sense that we are a united body, a body of believers, and we are there working with each other for the common good through the Holy Spirit who gives us to be there for each other, to help each other develop in these gifts, help us to be able to reach out to each other in each one's need as is required. The Holy Spirit does that work. So that's why he's speaking in human terms now, because he understands the limitations, but he'll build off of these limitations as we get to chapter 12. So he's saying, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, that's where we all came from, by the way. We all were born in sin, okay? None of us was born righteous. The only one that was born righteous was Jesus Christ. And the reason I don't mention Adam is because Adam was created out of the dirt. He wasn't born in the sense in this, in the sense of how we are born today, right? Out of the womb. So the reason Jesus Christ is the only one 
through God the Father and the Holy Spirit that was ever brought to earth that was born without sin. A human being totally human like you and I, but also totally God, okay? So, so as for us, we, we, not Jesus Christ, we were presented, you know, as our members as slaves to impurity because that's who we were. That's all we understood. That is, that's our natural nature. Our natural nature is that fallen nature that we inherited from our forefathers, right? So he says, we were slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Now, when he's talking about lawlessness leading to lawlessness, that is the whole description of the problem of sin. If you all have experienced this at some level at some time in your lives, remember when you may have told a lie to somebody about something? I mean, maybe it was even before you were saved. Maybe it was after you were saved. I don't know. But just keep it in your mind. Then all of a sudden, somebody addressed something different to you, maybe on the same day, a different day, and it somehow touched that original lie that you had told. And what did it cause you to have to do? It caused you to have to think up another lie to support that first lie. Okay, so what, what Paul is saying is that le lawlessness that leads to more lawlessness is the fact that when we commit sin, sin leads to more sin in its natural state. It's not like, you know, you can do one sin and then that's it. You don't have to sin anymore. At least that way you can say, okay, hey, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm not a bad sinner. Well, the reality is, is that in our natural state, sin leads to more sin or lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. It's because we don't have any control over that. That is our fallen nature, our fallen problem, our fallen proclivities. And that's where we would typically walk without any help. But now he says, but now that you understand who you are and the help that you have, which is through the Holy Spirit, we don't no longer present our members as slaves uh, to sin. But now we present our members as slaves to righteousness. And notice what he leads into, leading to sanctification. See, the righteousness isn't our doing. The righteousness is Christ's doing. He did it for us on the cross. And through him and through his strength and his power and through the Holy Spirit who indwells us, we now present our members as slaves to righteousness through their, through his strength, I'll say, you know, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. And through that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are carrying out the Galatians 5.16, that we are walking with the Spirit so that we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. And Romans 8, where we are becoming more transformed into the image of the Father's Son, which is we're becoming more like Christ. That is sanctification. Sanctification is our daily development, spiritually, righteously, in the way that makes us look more like Jesus in all that we do, that we reflect him on all that we do. When we get cut off on I-4, we bless the person. Oh, God bless you. You know, that that becomes our first desire instead of, you know, uh, informing them of their shortcomings, you know, in very graphical terms. So that is what sanctification is. Now, sanctification is an ongoing process. Sanctification is that process where God is transforming us to be more like Christ, okay? Now, that's not something that you can say, okay, I've arrived. You know, like, okay, I, I'm the most sanctified individual there ever was, okay? Well, the reality is, no. As long as we carry this old nature with us, we still struggle. But in him, we have the strength to overcome. And he gives us that power. He gives us that strength. He gives us that ability to walk in his righteousness as we continue to be sanctified in him. And that's a beautiful picture because remember, the father disciplines those he loves. Now, 
sanctification isn't this cushy thing that you can say, okay, I'm being sanctified and man, I just need to kind of cross my legs and my arms and, and hum a bit or something like, you know, those far Eastern gurus do, but that, oh yeah, everything's just gonna be nice. No, part of our sanctification is God's discipline. He carries out our training. He carries out our development through the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times that requires us to go through difficult times as he's showing that he has us in his arms. He's got us. And we trust him more even through it. We don't blame him and say, oh, if God was a God of love, he wouldn't let me be going through this or that. What we'd be saying is more uh, on the realm in the realm of what is it you're trying to teach me now, Lord, and help me to walk in your righteousness. In other words, what are you trying to teach me? Let me be who you would have me be, because I know, as we'll see in Romans 8, 28, that he works all things out for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So as we are his and he develops us and makes us more like him, he, we go through these, these situations in life that put us in a position to learn and to develop and put the old nature behind and walk in that new newness of life in that righteousness that God provides. So any questions through sanctification or his building up as we develops us into the image of Jesus Christ up through verse 19. So, so, yeah, Ted, go ahead, Mark. Uh, so you will say that sanctification, even though uh, it requires uh, this position, in other words, you know, if we want to learn, we need to study, right? We're studying the Bible. Absolutely. So if we want, if we want to grow in God, it's going to take willpower. In other words, we, we we have to we have to be willing to. Amen. Because the more we put in, the closer we get to God. Amen. So if I if I, I guess some people cannot distinguish this thing, it's nothing to do with being saved. That's right. Uh, it boils down and says how how close are we going to be to God? The reason Amen. why we are here uh, starting this class is because we want to learn, right? Amen. Well, someone to say, you know, I don't want to waste my time. I'm already <laughs> saved. Uh, I, I know enough. I know enough to get by. So so with God, just like a personal relationship with someone that we have beyond this earth, if we take time to to connect with a person and uh, uh, connect them on their birthday and, and have a meal with them, well, we're going to have a good relationship, right? Right. But if we have someone that that is an acquaint acquaintance and we just call them once in a blue, oh well, you know, there's not much of a relationship there. So right. that's the same the same the same thing we got. I, I read a book by Charles Window. It was called Intimacy with the Almighty. Amen. Uh, and he make a made a comparison there. That uh, the same way we take time to have a meal, well, we should take time to communicate with God every day. Amen. Right. Absolutely. Because that, that's how you build relationship. Amen. Yep. Yeah. It, I mean, it. a relationship takes time and work. A human relationship. Think about it. We're building a, a, an eternal relationship with Almighty God. We're going to be working with him, developing and becoming more personal with him, even when we get to go be with him. It's not like all of a sudden, okay, hey, I've, I've arrived now. No, it, like Martin says, it takes work. It's not something you can just say, okay, I've got it, you know, and th next, it doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't work that way. So yeah, we continue to grow and also, uh-oh, I'm getting a, your internet connection is unstable. Am I dropping out? Yeah, you did. A few seconds, you, did. So you came back. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, the, the thing went away. Man, that's the first time I've seen that in a long time. Yeah, you just got you just got cut off for a moment. Okay, okay, okay. Are you using Spectrum? Yeah, I use Spectrum. Uh, yeah, we're <laughs> we're lucky we even have, can have this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lord, keep it going. I pray. So anyway, when we look at that, we realize that hey, to have a relationship with God does require work. And I mean, but then again, it's not heavy work. Remember, the Lord, Jesus said, hey, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. When we lean into him, 
he gives us his strength to overcome. Okay, so we it, it's this symbiotic relationship that we have together and we lean into his strength, supernatural power to work through all of these issues and to develop and to become more like Christ in all that we do. So it is ongoing. I mean, I could give you a whole lesson just on the Bible talking about how much we need, we will suffer for the namesake of God. I mean, Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it. Jesus talks about it. Jesus said, hey, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you too. You know, I mean, suffering is part of who we are in Christ. Now, of course, we don't like to talk about that today, right? <laughs> Everybody wants to hear that walking with the Lord is this cushy, wonderful thing that, man, you never have to worry about a thing. And yes, we don't have to worry about anything in Christ Jesus, but it's about the relationship and walking in him. And in and through it, as we're obedient to him, he provides all our needs. Okay. It doesn't mean that we're going to have, you know, this $25 million mansion because we're walking with him, unless somehow that's his plan and purpose to be able to further his kingdom through any one of us here on earth. But I haven't seen that happen yet, okay? But, <laughs> but the issue is he wants surrendered people that are vessels worthy of his use. That's part of sanctification. Sanctification is surrendering to him and growing in him, okay? So, in verse 20 says, for when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, Righteousness wasn't even a thing that would have even crossed your mind when we were in our old nature. I mean, we may use the term good. Well, maybe you wanted to be good to somebody here and there, but that's not righteousness. Good is not righteousness. They're not synonymous in that respect. Righteousness has to do with spiritual, uh, spiritual uprightness, okay? Being good, you can fake good, okay, just by your actions to somebody, but that doesn't mean that you're righteous. Righteousness comes through a spiritual walk with the Lord. It is an uprightness before him. It is a surrender before him. So when you look at that, you realize that our old nature didn't even have any righteousness in it because we were not tied to the Savior our, and through his saving grace. But he says in verse 21, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? Well, the fruit was the fruit of the flesh. Okay. So in our old nature, that was what we were focused on. Our, our focus was on, well, what can I do to meet my needs of the flesh or to somehow increase my materialism or, or just to make myself happy? In a sense, it's almost like you are your own God. Okay. It's, I'm the one in control. I'm the one that wants everything. I want it my way and that's it. You know, it's the Burger King thing, right? And so when you look at that and you look back at who you were back then, you can kind of understand Paul's statement of the things of which you are now ashamed, the way we were in life that now you say, that's not the way I want to be. That is shameful. It has nothing of eternal value of godly eternal value in it and so that has no place in who we are today in jesus christ okay and we're ashamed of the way we were back then in our sinful nature against him okay so he says for the end of those things is death and i'll tell you what if you look i mean that ties in really well with the last part of revelation which it talks about the second death, okay? Because the people that never come out of that proclivity, that live in that sinful nature all the way through to the time they die and don't turn their lives over to the Lord, they don't come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't come into a righteous living. They stay in their old nature and their proclivities. The, the, the scriptures are clear that at the great white throne, when they're thrown into hell, that's called the second death. It is what they, it is their only future. There is no other future for those people. And that's 
the lifestyle that we who are in Christ Jesus now are ashamed that we were in it because it all it did was contrary and it was antagonistic to the Lord our God. Okay. And the end of that way is death. It is eternal death. Okay. But in verse 22, he says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get. And that's, remember, the fruit I was talking about is what we were talking about in Galatians 5. Go look at verses like 20 to 23, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and it's in eternal life. Now, when, when we come into Christ, let me go over here to Galatians 5, 20 here a minute. Oops, wrong, Galatians 5, 2. Let's try this again. Okay, uh, but look in verse 22, here it is. This is what are the characters, uh, are the values, the fruit values of the spirit in us that make up one fruit, okay? Notice it's not fruits of the spirit, it is fruit of the spirit. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Isn't that always at the top, you know, for the greatest, remember faith, uh, love, faith, hope, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. Remember how he breaks those out? Love is at the top of the list in terms of who we are. That's, that's the major character representation of God in us, love. He gives us joy. Now, joy isn't happiness. Joy is a deep-seated uh, kind of peace that reigns, and that's why it flows real well from love, joy, to peace. And when we have love, joy, and peace, guess what? We're not in a hurry. We're in God's time. We have patience, okay? And out of all of that, we don't have to be feel like we're in a pressure cooker, but instead, when we reach out to others, we have kindness, goodness, and faithfulness in all that we carry out as part of those character values. And we are gentle with people, and it's all wrapped up in love, but the love and all of this is wrapped up with self-control. So all those nine fruit of the spirit are all one element in us. They all flow together and make us who we are. And that's what Paul is talking about here. We, in those, in that one fruit of the spirit, we represent the righteousness of God. And we look more like Jesus as this fruit shows through in each and every one of us. So let me go back here a minute. So when we look at that, we realize, wow, that's the fruit that he's talking about. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get, okay? And all of that oneness leads to sanctification. Okay, so as we see that fruit grow and materialize in us, we then, that is within the sanctification process because that is Jesus's nature. It is who we are to become. We are to become more like him. We're growing in him and its end is eternal life. That is the promise. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. The description of fruit, it didn't say uh, being disciples and, and spreading the good news. Yeah, not there. But see, this fruit of the spirit, Aaron, yeah, I mean, I could show you in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, where the Great Commission is, that speaks to exactly what you're talking about. But one of the things that you find is that if we go, let me just go to Matthew 28 real quick here, because I think uh, what you see is that before you go out and make disciples, there's a process that happens, okay? Look what he says here in verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, okay? So in other words, we are in Christ Jesus. We are in him. We have his authority to go out and do what we're called to do. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now look at the order of things that have to happen 
in the process of making disciples, okay? And think about it, the people that have already, are the ones going out, have already been through this process. He says, first baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that's not salvation, salvation already happened, okay? The baptism is a representation or a confirmation in public of who you are in Christ Jesus, that you've died with him and are risen to get newness of life. But look what happens here. Notice that he doesn't say, okay, now just go out. He says, you've got to teach them, okay? Now in the teaching, this is part of that development where they are made sensitive to the fruit of the spirit. Remember, Jesus talked to his disciples in John 14 through 16, and he was telling them that they have to go out and bear much fruit, okay? So part of the growth process in becoming more like Christ, we got to teach them. I mean, it's not something that they just have in a moment's notice. Now, I mean, there are some that, man, motivatedly, as soon as they accept Jesus, they want to go tell somebody else. And that's good. We'll talk about that in Romans 10. But, and we should tell other people. But to go and make disciples, now we're talking not just about salvation of individuals, we're talking about individuals that are developed to be more like Christ, that when they go out, they are well, they are well developed spiritually to go out and also build up individuals the same way. They've got to be able to go out there and not only bring them into Christ's saving grace through Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but also to be able to baptize them, to develop them, teach them, to bring them into the kingdom. Look how long it took Jesus with his disciples, three years, okay? And that was 24 seven, basically, that Jesus was with the disciples, you know, teaching them, bringing them up, turning them into disciples of Jesus Christ to understand what the good news was all about, right? And he says, so we're teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So in other words, we shouldn't be sending people out as disciples before they are properly developed so that they are ready through the Holy Spirit to go out and make other disciples. If they start without the background, think about the way the world is today and all of those issues that are going to confront a person going out to bring the good news to people. I mean, how do they answer questions about uh, these world views that are out there with our young people today? How do they deal with these things that now are sinful, but people are saying, no, that's good. That's how it should be. You know, how do they address those people yet still do it in love and reaching out to them in a way that's not condemning or judgmental, but loving and still bring that out. See, that takes time to develop people into that because it's very easy to feel like if those people get upset with you or maybe even want to you know, hit you or something because you, you don't believe the way they do, how do you respond? Do you respond in kind? Did Jesus respond that way to those that treated him shamefully? No. See, these are all the things that we're talking about and that Paul is talking about too, is that as we get developed, the fruit that he's been talking about is that we have those character values of Christ to be able not only to reach out to the people and teach them, but that we have the character of Christ in the process, which is a loving, caring, uh, you know, uh, desire to be there for them, regardless of what you may have to go through in the process. So no, that was a good question, Aaron, because it does fit with exactly what he's talking about. So that's why he's saying you were slave to sin, but now you become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed and have been set free from sin. Oh, wait a minute. Am I in the right place? I've already did that. I'm sorry. This is where I wanted to be. But now that you have been set free from sin, it started out the same way and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. So the fruit is what contributes in to the developing of others to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And in and through that, that's how then we reach out to people, just as Jesus did. Jesus didn't antagonistically go against anybody. I mean, he reached out in loving care to those that really were truly seeking him.
And of course, but at the same time, since he had to call the Pharisees on the carpet because they were living a lie, they were saying they were representing God when they weren't. So Jesus had to call them on the carpet, but yet he didn't get a baseball bat after him and say, here, let me get you tuned in right. You know, he just told them. And of course, what did they do? The Bible says, I mean, in the Gospels, it says they sought a way to kill him. That's what they wanted to do. You know, they did not like that they were being called on the carpet for being phonies. Okay. So when we look at that, that fruit, we understand it's, it's of a full package as we get developed as disciples to then reach out and develop others, just as Aaron had asked the question. Because look at verse 23, and we know this one, if you're familiar with the Romans road to salvation, this is one of the crucial verses in the Romans road to saving the salvation, if you're going to, you know, use the Romans road as, as the vehicle to, to tell of the biblical part that can give people what they need to understand that they, what they need to do to receive Jesus' saving grace. Look what he says in verse 23. Most of us know this one by heart, Romans 3, or 6.23, right? For the wages of sin is death. Remember, Romans 3.23 says, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? We know that that's a fact. Everybody's a sinner. There's none righteous, no, not one. But look what he says in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. So if 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means the wages for every individual is death because we're all sinners, right? But look what he says. But it doesn't stop there. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So there is a way to be able to come out of that old nature that he was talking about, our slavery to sin, to come in to a, being a slave to righteousness. And that is through Jesus Christ and eternal life from his free gift of salvation. And that is the only way out of the wages of sin. Jesus paid it all. That was the term that the theologists used. That was propitiation. In other words, the payment that was due to the individual, Jesus paid it for us. We should have paid it, but he did it for those who come into his saving grace. So that's as far as we're going to get tonight. That finishes chapter six. We can see how the picture of sin is painted out and how he brings us in to who we are in Christ Jesus and righteousness today. And we will grow in this area. That's where we will build up, right? We will become more like Christ as the fruit of the spirit develops in us. And as then we are able to reach out to others and, and share the saving grace that Jesus has for all mankind if they just reach out and accept the good news that we can present to them through jesus christ so yeah so yeah go ahead Mar uh martin so going back to the, the the verse that we just the final verse there yeah there's no excuse for a christian to say well you know i'm a slave to sin it's, right. it's not because you know we've been we, we have been set free Amen. we we have we have changed from 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 being a slave of this world and sin Amen. to being a slave to god Amen. As a matter of fact, there's a song out there called The Great Exchange because Christ has paid the price that, that we were supposed to pay. Exactly. You know, the, 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 uh, the wages of sin is death. Yeah. And he he died in, in our behalf. And, and that's another thing that people don't understand that it every sin has to be punished. Someone needs to pay. That's it. Is either a person going to pay by, 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 by himself or Christ is going to pay. But someone needs to pay. That's right. Because God is a righteous God. He, he demands holiness. Amen. So there's no way to say, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm going to let it go by. No, no such thing. That's Every right. sin has to be punished. That's right. So it's either we take we take the price that, that, that Christ paid at the cross, or we basically we have to pay on our own. So someone needs to pay. That's right. Yep, yeah, because, I mean, in our default state, all of us would have paid at the great white throne. That would be the eternal judgment and the final judgment of condemnation because those are the people that did not accept Jesus's free gift of salvation. But as Martin said, you know, once we accept the Jesus's sacrificial payment, he covered all the cost, 
or the wages of the sin for those who come into his saving grace. He pays the price for us. But yeah. those yeah. that don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And we have we have a perfect example in the Bible. I mean, uh you have you have David, right? When David sinned against uh, against God with the daughter with the uh, what was the lady's name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba? You know, his son, okay. God forgave David, but his son had to pay. Yeah. His son died. He did. Uh, the other case, the other case when they were they were carrying the the, the ark, right? Right. Uh, where is it? Uzzah. Uh Uzzah. catches yeah. the ark. Yeah. And and he and he gets he gets extinguished right away. <laughs> yeah. Because God already has established that only the Levites were to touch the ark. That's right. And, and someone will say, Well, yeah, but that's not fair. Well, <laughs> God is God, and we Amen. are not. Amen. Amen. I tell you, it's, I mean, when you really get to know the wonder of God's word, you see what amazing love is portrayed throughout. And I'll tell you, he's given it to each and every one who was willing to accept his saving grace because he paid the price for it all. Amen. Any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements? Sounds like a win-win situation. Hey, I'll tell you, you can't lose with the Lord. That's a fact. That's you right. can't lose with the Lord. God is good so job, good. Kid. Amen. Okay, well, let's stop the share here. Okay, so now Paul's not done speaking to the matter of sin and the proclivities that we have as human beings. Okay, I mean, we're still going to talk about that more in chapter seven, but he's already laid all the definite firm groundwork that deals with sin. And we have to understand, you know, where it is so that that way we can understand what he's building to, especially when we get to chapter eight, because then we understand who we are and the wonders of what God has for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not just like, okay, salvation is just that. Salvation has benefits. I mean, I, I like Psalm 103 that says, and consider all his benefits. You know, I mean, there are benefits in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his benefits, we're going to really talk about a lot in chapter 8. So, we're good then? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Okay. So, uh, Hey, I still got uh, Victor's uh, children on here. I mean, we're going to keep praying for them. Mark and Shell, we want to keep praying for them, that God will work in them. Sound good? You're very good. We got another request. Yeah, go ahead, Vic. Uh, last Tuesday, uh, we got a message that a uh, postal worker was mauled by four pit bull dogs. Oh, I saw that. And she passed away. Oh, she did die. I heard she got bad. She got beat up bad. Had to amputate an an arm and a leg. And it just couldn't get her to stop bleeding. So these five uh, pit bull dogs are being euthanized, was the word I heard. Yeah. But she lost her life on the job. Uh, Yeah, I saw that. I just saw that it was in Florida. I don't know where in Florida. But yeah, that was bad. It was up there in Interlock and Lake Estates. Uh, oh, I used wow. To own, I used to own some property up there, so I know ex- exactly where it is. And it's right. up uh, up near Palatka somewhere. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. That was... That's, man. <sighs> wow. <laughs> yeah, never we're praying for peace for their family. You never know when you get up in the morning what's going to happen. No. And uh, yeah, I read another part and another part where they said that's not, you know, it's not uncommon. Like thousand, a thousand dog attacks happen to postal workers uh, like on a weekly basis. Yep. I mean, obviously not as bad as this one, but still, yes, not good. Any other prayer items, prayer requests? 
Uh, Ted, yeah, yep. uh, we have mentioned uh, David, uh, yeah, Schwann, and his daughter, uh, Dora. She has she has a uh, yeah. leukemia. Yeah, she's going through the whole process, but yeah, let's continue praying for her. Okay. Do you know her 25 name? Twenty-five years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know her name? No, I do not. Okay. But you okay. just put, you just put his name. Yeah. No. No God, problem. No problem. God, no. That's what I remember it by is David's daughter. Yeah. I know his last name is Schwab. That's that's uh. S C H. Uh, where is it again? The first name's fine. First name's fine. David Schwab. S yeah. S C H uh, W A B Schwab. Oh Schwab. Okay. Just mm -hmm. like the insurance company or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a famous name. Okay. Famous last name, I should say. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'm surprised at how much cancer is going on. Speaking of that, we need to put Julie on here. Julie's been having some really bad problems uh with her cancer um she had some other like a covid that really got bad to the point where she was having seizures and the doctor was holding off because i mean needed to get that part fixed first before they could go in and do the the colon resection of her cancer but they're concerned because they're afraid it has advanced too much and that it may have already metast metastasized so we need to be praying for Julie, uh, Ivan, her husband too, both of them actively fighting cancer right now. And, and I mean, it's, it's not like in, in remission. I mean, they are dealing with the heavy stuff. And then of course, Wilfred, our brother, who's been in our class, you know, for ever, he's, he's back on chemo. They, they did go in on his liver and take out, did a procedure to take out that lump of cancer that had metastasized from his colon he doesn't have a high percentage of recovery i think they gave him like 25 percent is all they've given him but they've got him they got that out of there they got the him on the chemo so we're going to keep praying for wilfred but but those are the ones also on top of this david's daughter that we need to be praying for for cancer it seems like cancer is just yeah. problematic mm -hmm. Yeah, David has someone else talk about cancer. Uh, Lynn Pinter, you know, missionary from our church, she just came from uh, Togo. Yeah. And one of the uh, gentlemen that went with her, his name is Charlie, uh, he has prostate cancer. Yeah. And uh, basically, uh, the cancer has uh, metastasized. Oh. So yeah. basically, he, yeah, he, did, he doesn't have, unless God, that's a miracle. That's it. Yeah. 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 And he, he went like that to Africa, what? but yeah. Wow. Yeah, that prostate cancer. I've had mine already. I had to have half of my prostate frozen, you know, so. Let me tell you, even even though the, uh, you know, the science has advanced so much for the prostate cancer with men, and it's like, whoa, this. Yeah, yeah. Aren't you hit like 40? Is it on yeah. a large prostate or prostate cancer? Well, we'll be praying for him, you know, I mean. But, you know, one of the things I found, like there was in my other church that I go to, the Lockhart Baptist Church, and I teach there, um, the financial guy, he had, um, not prostate, but cancer, what's the other organ, a small organ, man, another kind of cancer. But anyway, God had been healing that cancer. Man, I thought God was going to free him of it. He had stage four um, gallbladder. Uh, and, and I mean, it, it looked like everything, because they didn't want to take out his gallbladder because it was too problematic. They had to shrink it down. They had to put on chemo and everything. And it looked like they were going to say, hey, it looks like everything's back to normal. And then he had, then he had a stroke. So that chemo can also be problematic in other areas. He had a stroke and then he passed away last week. But I mean, it's like, but hey, he knows Jesus Christ. I mean, yes, it's hard on the family, but I'll tell you, at least he's up there with the Lord and we'll see him again. And I mean, but it just goes to show that man, this cancer thing is really out there. I, I mean, I have like eight people I'm praying for at the other church for cancer. It's just, man, it's out there. Yeah, so we'll be praying for Charlie on that prostate cancer matter uh, for Elaine Pinter's uh, missionary. Uh, anybody else? 
Yeah, Ted, just continue to pray for me for my fibromyalgia. Okay. I'm getting new fibromyalgia pain, new pain. Oh, pain. oh no. Pain in places I didn't have it before, and it's very severe. Oh, man. There feels like there's a meat hook in my waist. Oh, and it's no. Hooked, it's hooked from the inside of my hip, you know, there. Right, and it's right. it's pulling on me on both sides. Oh, no. It's yeah, horrible. Absolutely. And I sleep on a heated pad and then cover up with another heated pad. And, uh. That's rough. That's rough. Yeah, I, I have a couple. Well, you know, Sherry, she's got fibromyalgia. And, uh, uh, I've, oh, you, you guys don't know Ginger. She was in my other life group, Foundations Life Group, but she has fibromyalgia. So I've been praying. So I've been praying for all you ladies with fibromyalgia. I know it's, man, it's terrible pain. You got it, Misty. Any others? Thank you, Ted. You're welcome. You're welcome, Misty. Can I get you to put a name on the list for Jesse, J-E-S-S-E? -S -S -E. It's a man at work that uh, clearly needs a miracle. Okay. So I can't figure out what's wrong with him, and he's he's bad off. So it's a physical problem? It is. Okay. You got it, my sister. Any others? Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ for us all. I mean, as we study this, this part of Romans where we talk about our sinful natures and our sinful problem and our sinful proclivities, it's awesome to see what you did for us. Not only did you send Jesus to die on the cross for our sin, but also to restore a relationship with you that otherwise we would have not had. I mean, had Jesus not died on that cross, we would have all been, you know, sent to go before the great white throne for all intents and purposes. But because of your saving grace and your love and your sacrifice for us, Lord Jesus, thank you that we who have come into your saving grace have eternal life and we will be with you forever. Help us to walk in your righteousness, because that is what we are a slave to now, and no longer to, you know, walk in the old nature. Yes, there will be those times when we struggle with something, and we may end up sinning, but Lord, we know that you already paid the price for it, and your grace is sufficient. And just like you told Paul that your grace is sufficient for us, and that your strength is made perfect in weakness. We know that when we fail, we have you and your strength to overcome, to get us out of it and to walk in your righteousness, Lord. So, Lord, I pray for your strength, your guidance, your direction for all of us as we walk in your righteousness, Lord. May you be glorified in and through it all for your honor and glory. Now, Lord, I want to bring these prayer items to you. Oh, and let me thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I mean, sometimes we address these things, but we fall short of thanking you for all that you have done for us. We can't ever thank you enough, but we praise you. We honor and we glorify you. Now, Lord, I bring up these prayer items that, you know, we've been talking about. You've heard them, but we're just going to reiterate them again. And we bring them before your throne, for I know that you you know, and dwell the praises and the prayers of your people. And so we bring them to you, Lord, humbled before you, looking for your amazing grace in the process. I pray for Mark and Shell, Lord, Victor's children, Lord, that there would be a healing in their relationships and that they would, they would seek you, Lord, and that they would come into understanding you, knowing you, and finding you, Lord. And that their, their, I guess their character and whatnot would be changed such that it would be a loving and accepting character in terms of uh, Victor and Dottie's relationship. Please work in and through them, Lord, and show them that only in and through you is their peace and the opportunity in you. And that in and only through you is their eternal life too. 
But we look to you, Lord, because only you can work in their hearts and in their minds. And we lean into you for that. I pray for the family of the postal worker that died due to the dog attack. Yeah, that's sad, Lord. And, oh, I just pray that you be there with them, Lord, and give them peace. I don't know the person individually. Only you know the individual that was attacked and suffered all that at, at you know, the attack of those dogs. But Lord, we look to you for that situation and for your peace in that matter. I pray for David's daughter who has cancer. We brought her up to you a couple of weeks ago and last week, and I just want to lift her up to you. So many people have cancer today, and it's like, man, alive, you know, but you are Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. We lean into you, Lord, and we ask for your healing hand on this young lady, 25-year-old, Lord, that you would be with her and that you would heal the leukemia that she's dealing with, Lord. I also pray for Julie, and you know her situation and all the maladies and the physical problems she's having even before she can have the operation she needs to have immediately uh, to be able to address the, the colon cancer problem that she's been dealing with. And her husband, Ivan, also who's been dealing with the, you know, active cancer, who also needs to go up to Shands in Jacksonville. And I mean, maybe even to have uh, bone marrow work done, which he's already had once. And it's, not good. It's it's a very debilitating and painful kind of process, and it takes a long time to recover from, Lord. But we look to you. Pray for Wilfred also, as now he's on a chemo now the second time, that you would be with him too, Lord. And we pray for your healing hand on each and every one of them. I pray for Charlie, who, who was with Elaine Painter, the missionary, Lord, that you would be with him. Put your healing hand on him, too, for his prostate cancer. Lord, you know his situation. But, Lord, he's, he went to serve you anyway. And, he, Lord, I just pray for your healing hand on him, that you would be with him and resolve that matter. I pray for Misty, Lord, and this, this new development within her fibromyalgia that's causing even more pain than what she was dealing with her, for her fibromyalgia before that you would be with her too, Lord, put your healing hand on her. Because I mean, I, I've just not seen any doctor remedies that seem to really be able to address that condition, you know, in a way that finally, you know, mitigates the pain. We look to you, Lord, and ask for your strength in and through that, that you would give her healing and be with her, Lord. I also pray, you know, for Dottie's request uh, for Jesse, and who needs a miracle. You understand what Jesse's going through and his, the physical issue that he's, your issues that he's dealing with, that you would be with him, Lord, and that you would put your healing hand on him. Lord, only you can understand these things and understand the best way to be able to address them. We lean into you for your perfect plan and purpose in every single one of these requests, Lord, and we trust you because you are our Lord and our God. Now, Lord, I pray for our nation and for our leaders. Uh, man, I, I pray that we would come back to you. I mean, if, if we have a motto that says, in God we trust, I mean, I would hope that we would come back to that state and be a nation that truly trusts in you and looks to you, Lord, for the leadership of our nation. But in the meantime, Lord, I pray that you would work through those elected officials that are either at the federal, state, or local levels, that you would work in each and every one of them to make the right decisions, decisions that honor you, Lord, and aren't just, you know, seeking to satisfy the masses' desire that in most cases is not very righteous. Lord, we look to you. And we don't want to grieve you, Lord. We want to please you. And the only way that's going to happen is there needs to be a renewal within our nation. But it needs to happen first in our churches, Lord. Because, I mean, the only way the world is going to come, or the rest of the nation is going to come, is if they see you working in a mighty way 
in a loving and caring way amongst our members of our churches that are out there, that we would represent you well in a way that reflects your righteousness and your fruit working through us, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, as we go, I pray that you go with us and that you, Lord, would be honored and glorified in each and every one of us and in all that we do. Continue to develop us, Lord, to make us more like Christ, that we would reflect you in every way and in every situation. We love you and we praise you and we give you all the honor and the glory and we love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. Have a great time at church tomorrow. Yay. Yay. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. You're welcome, my brother. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Give love to Wendy Martin. Give love Good to Good night. Sarah. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night, everybody. Thank God we have a church to go to, Ted. Oh. Oh. Uh, well, Thank God how that, we can, that we can. We have. We have freedom of religion and everything, and that we have a church Amen. to go to, and that we're not Praise like you know. Praise God. Exactly. Exactly. Play it while you can. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good night. Okay. Good night, Martin. Good night, Thank Aaron, you. brother. Thank you, Ted. Good, good night. night. Yeah. Good night there, Bobby. I mean, Corey and Misty and Bobby, if he's there. So, yeah. He's there. Oh, okay. Good night. Well, good night. God take care of y'all, too. Bless you. Good night, Dad. Good night there, Margaret. God bless you, my sister. Thank you. You got it, my sister. Hey, we'll pick up with Romans chapter seven. We made it through another chapter. That's right. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> well, take care of yourself, Margaret. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Bye -bye. Thank you. You're welcome.